We've got our kernel panel here today. And uh, moderating is James Bottomley. So if I can have the kernel folks come on out, I will introduce each of you. James. There we go. <laughs> James Bottomley. Right. Thank you. And we have Greg Crow Hartman, Ted Cho, Sarah Sharp. Up you come. And last but not least, someone you may know, Linus Torvalds. Welcome, guys. Come on out. Welcome. Okay, so arrange yourselves on these seats, please. No, I'll stand. I wouldn't want to sit next to any of you. Now, um, first things first. So Jim did a fairly brief introduction. Um, so I think we want to do a slightly more interesting introduction. And to do that, I think you probably want to do it yourselves. Um, so what I want you to do is say who you are, what you do, and one fact about yourself that's hopefully interesting that probably not many people in the room know. So I'll go first. I'm James Bottomley. I'm SCSI subsystem maintainer and peer risk maintainer and also CTO of server virtualization at Parallels. And the interesting thing you might not know about me is that contrary to my effort to lend sartorial elegance to this event, if you ever actually run into me anywhere near my home in London, you'll find me in a pair of shorts with no shoes. So I think next one up is uh, Linus. Um, so I'm Linus. Uh, there is absolutely nothing interesting about me. Uh, I had figured that out, you know. Yeah, no. If you run into my home, I'll be in a bath, ratty bathrobe uh, <laughs> reading email. That's what I do. I read email, I answer emails, the ones I think are worth answering, and I merge code written by others. I have not written my own code in the last five years, as far as I can tell. Great. I'm Greg Crow Hartman. I'm with the Linux Foundation. Um, I'm a kernel developer. I do lots of things there. Um, one thing I don't know. Uh, if, oh, when I started the Linux Foundation, Jim told me there was one rule, and that was you have to shower by 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and my family is very appreciative of that rule. <laughs> Sarah. So I'm Sarah Sharp. I'm the USB 3 driver maintainer. And uh, one interesting fact about me. I like to automate my garden watering system with Arduinos. <laughs> Ted. Uh, my name is Ted Cho. Uh, I am the ext4 file system maintainer. And uh, I work at Google, working on file systems and storage. And well, one interesting fact that I guess a number of folks here may have noticed is that I've lost a little bit of weight. Um, <laughs> And uh, although everyone keeps joking about the fact that uh, I deserve a uh, commission from Fitbit, because I seem to have been pushing that a lot, uh, that I've actually also been uh, hitting the gym a lot. So I've become a bit of a gym rat. So. Congratulations. I believe Linus was just pointing out that you transferred most of the weight to him rather than losing it. <laughs> so. For the audience, this is supposed to be interactive. There should be microphones. I can't see them, but they're somewhere in the hall, and you should be able to find them, because I'm not going to stand up here for 45 minutes making up all of the questions. Although, since Twitter joined the Linux Foundation, I decided that I would actually try and join Twitter. Um, so I did put out a tweet asking for people to submit questions. And the wonderful thing about that is I got 100 new friends and precisely four questions. Um, <laughs> So I think we'll begin with something that my predecessor on this, John Corbett, who unfortunately couldn't be here uh, for personal reasons today, uh, usually asks, which is the um, aging maintainers problem. Um, and this time, in order to demonstrate that we're not oh, a load of gray-bearded <laughs> fuddy-duddies, we actually have Sarah on the panel <laughs> to represent youth. <laughs> and so I think. I'll, I'm actually going to turn the question around and ask Sarah, as someone who's not one of the aging original maintainers, <laughs> tell us what some of the problems we have attracting youth is and how we should go about fixing them. Um, you know, it's, it's, now are you talking Linux or kernel specifically? I'm talking Linux and kernel specific. Pick whichever one you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that there's some misconceptions about uh, the kernel community and, you know, I think that uh, for younger people, sometimes they may not think that the Linux kernel is sexy particularly, but with, you know, Android and tablets and phones, I think that that's 
kind of become more of an interest. Um, and I think that some people have the misconception that we yell at each other all the time and there's, there's fights going on, but I think it depends on which mailing list you're actually on. Uh, <laughs> if you're gonna send something stupid to LKML, then yeah, you might get yelled at, but if you send you know, useful things, then usually it's constructive criticism, I find. Um, but I think too that it's difficult to get new people involved, and so I've been sort of toying around with the idea of starting more of a uh, sort of mentorship program. So if you're interested in that, talk with me afterwards, and and uh, we'll see if we can get some more younger people involved. So if I may, what was the first thing that got you interested in Linux? Well, the first thing that got me interested in Linux was that my professor was actually already involved in the open source community in Portland. And so he actually dragged me to some uh, Linux kernel bearings. And so I got to know more of the community. And then Greg uh, approached Bart and said, hey, I've got this project. Do you have a student? And it was uh, USBFS2, which has never been published, never but got me it. in. I, I'll finish it eventually. <laughs> yeah. So I think that maybe uh, we need more of a mentor relationship and, and projects that can get people in. OK. So Linus, who are you going to mentor? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think you want to scare away even more young people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But do you think the idea of mentoring people is a good one? I, I, you can't say no to that question. Exactly, you? that's why <laughs> I did it. Uh, so no, that, you said, yes, that idea sucks. Let's it. never mentor anybody. Uh, uh, I, I think different people just come into the community from different sources. And I mean, clearly universities have always been one source of, of a lot of kernel developers. Uh, I also think it's slightly unfair at every kernel summit point to all of us at the kernel summit and saying, you're getting old and gray. Uh, the fact is the people who come to the kernel summit are maybe not representative of most of the developers. We end up seeing a lot of the maintainers who often have been around for a long time for obvious reasons. And I, I do think that the developers are not necessarily always, always getting old at the same rate we are. That so if I may synthesize that, sense. we shouldn't invite our friends to the Kernel Summit. We should invite people who actually do the work. I think it <laughs> might be interesting if, if there are like driver <laughs> writers who really uh, are generating a lot of code and getting some of the new, new kids really to come to these things. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. OK. Any, either of you two have any comments on this? No, you said I mean, it all I, last year I mean, and the year before and the year before yeah, that. I mean, you keep, I mean, all right, so there's 3,000 people contributed to the Linux kernel last year, okay? And there's 85 of us here in one room. And 70 of us, or 50 of us, were probably here for the past 10 years. So, I mean, you can't really, there are new people coming in and new people doing good stuff, but yeah, it's, I don't know, it's a little unfair. But we do invite people. We used to have a maintainer lottery. We pick three people out of the maintainers file at random and then invite them, and that turned out to really not work. I mean, we no, not, I didn't do it. I still don't know year. why it didn't work. I mean, uh, it's my it, idea, so. Yeah, I don't know. It, it didn't seem to work for some reason. Because we talk about process things. We don't talk about necessarily technical things that's at the true. Kernel Summit because we don't have everybody that's involved in that technical area in the same room at the same time. Uh, one exception, we talked about module signing today, and that's because we explicitly invited everybody that was involved and locked them in the room, and we all fought, and Lena said no, and everybody said okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I was wrong, it was my fault. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so it's, the Kernel Summit's more about process and how we're developing things, not necessarily what the developers are doing. The mini summits, mini summits are great. We all, had a bunch of PCI people and a bunch of people that don't normally show up to Kernel Summits. They were all in the room and we worked together. Same thing with ARM and video and everything else. We had a USB summit last year in, in Vancouver and there was new people there. So. Yeah, I think if we were to take a look at uh, some of the subsystem workshops and not just simply the ones that uh, met, uh, to d uh, met during this week, such as ARM and media uh, uh, and uh, MemCG, but also uh, the Linux uh, file system storage MM, uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi will be meeting in Barcelona next month. I suspect you will find a lot more new blood in some of those more technical subsystem workshops, which is, I think, as it should be. OK, fair enough. So I don't necessarily see any members of the audience lining up yet. But members of the audience, just remember, this is a competition. You get points for making the moderator look good. Um, so if there is no one, 
We'll go to one of the Twitter questions, which was submitted by Sean Michael Kerner, a reporter, somewhere in the room. He's not daring to raise his hand. Um, and he wanted to talk... He's there. Okay. <laughs> he wants to talk about the bus problem, which means that a lot of us have thought about throwing Linus under the bus, especially <laughs> when he criticizes our patches, but what, hap what would we do if it actually happened? So, Linus. I, I always have the same answer, and that is, I won't care, right? <laughs> uh, but realistically, uh, we do have a very strong, I mean, development community including at the top. So I think the biggest problem would be there would be some politicking where uh, different companies would hope that they could kind of push whoever is the new maintainer in, in certain directions. And they've kind of gotten used to the fact that I'm, I'm hard to push around, but they'd get their hopes up and they would push Greg or somebody around, right? So there would be some politi politics going on, but at the same time, uh, the kernel project is, of all the open source projects, very, very special. Uh, I have talked to other project maintainers, and they have groups of four people, or groups for a big project, it might be groups of 20. I think the, I mean, X is a huge project. It's been around for 30 plus years. What? 10, 15? 10, 15 people. We have 3,000. We have, just at the kernel summit, we get 85 people, and that is maintainers, not necessarily developers. I mean, a lot of them do end up being developers as well, but I'm trying to say that the bus problem for the kernel does not exist because we just have such a huge mass of, of developers and maintainers. Other projects, if one of the ma top maintainers gets thrown under a bus, they just were decimated. The kernel, not so much. Anything to add, anybody else? No, one yeah. thing about Linux kernel development, it's not, I mean, I draw it as a nice perfect pyramid of things going up and patches flowing. I graphed it one year, and it was a, what, 15 meter long graph by three meters? I mean, it was huge, it's interconnected, it's a huge network effect. We route around people and we interact, so it's a very meshed networking system that can recover from problems. We have had people pass away that were maintainers of subsystems, and we survived and routed around them and worked, so. Yeah, I mean, I think one other thing that's actually fairly important to recognize is that many, many decisions happen near the bottom of the tree, right, by the people who are actually making the code. Um, there are occasions when Linus will step in and arbitrate if there's a serious debate between two people but I think very often most of the work that you've actually had to do when you've had to you know, speak ex cathedra has been either process questions or quality questions, not a technical decision. I mean, there are a few, but th those are uh, really the exceptions, not the rules. Yes. So I don't worry about technical issues at all because- Because you even trust if, me. <laughs> even if I make the wrong choice, which can sometimes happen, uh, <laughs> technical questions are easy to just say, oh, that was the wrong choice, let's fix it. Uh, I tend, and as already mentioned at the Kernel Summit too, a lot of the discussion is really about the flow and process, not about technical issues. And, and I think we have a really strong process. Okay, so still no questions from the audience. Come on, I need to, I think we could have done with a warm-up act to liven you up today. <laughs> so I will ask another one. Um, and you did actually mention things about we've been going for a long time. We've actually been going for 21 years. And if you look at most successful trends in the industry, they usually hit something they do really well. They stay at this sort of top plateau for a long time. And something else comes along and unseats them. You can see it in what happened with the PC revolution destroying effectively all of the other little computers and some of the mainframes. You can see it in the way that Microsoft is struggling to get outside the desktop with Windows. Do you think there's something coming along in the future that would unseat us? If yes, what and why? And if not, why not? And I think since we started with you, we'll start with Ted. All right. Uh, I think one of the things that's been really interesting about Linux is that it's been flexible enough that it's been able to be used in many, many different ways. Uh, I think it was uh, IBM saying at this point, probably close to 10 years ago, about Linux working on everything from wristwatches 
uh, to mainframes. Uh, when we first started working on Linux, I certainly had no conception uh, that we would be using it on cell phones. Heck, I don't think we had cell phones back then. Um, That's dating, yeah. Or we did. They were actually you know, pretty big beasts. Uh, so it, I think one of the things that's been really cool is to watch Linux be adaptable enough uh, to make it make the leap from you know, one successive set of hardware uh, challenges to another. Uh, and as long as we're flexible enough to accept the fact that you know, we may need to do things a little bit differently uh, to work, for example, on very low power devices such as mobile handsets, uh, we'll be able to adapt to many different uh, environments. And so as long as we stay flexible, uh, I think we can continue to you know, sort of make that leap as the wider industry moves on to newer things. But you know, could that change at some point? Um, obviously. Uh, but I don't know when that would be. That being said, I don't know what the next uh, big thing for Linux will be once we get past um, you know, sort of the mobile, the handset, the embedded, but I'm sure something will come along. You know, maybe it will be you know, driving little nanobots, uh, and we'll see what happens at that point. OK, thank you. Sarah? I don't know. I, I think it would, you know, I think maybe the next big thing is wearable computing. And so, you know, I don't know Linux might be too big for that particular thing. You might have something smaller, but one of the things I was concerned about for a while was, you know, with with Android, one of the good things about Linux is that it's so open, anyone can fork it and but we sort of if if that fork never came back in into Linux, then you know, we'd say, oh, that's fine, we'll continue on. But Android's so big right now that I'm glad they're finally sort of coming back to Linux so that we can actually learn from them and work with them more. So if I could pick up on that, is it that they're coming back to Linux or we or finally made our way to them? towards I don't them? Know. <laughs> I mean, it was only a 7,000 line fork. I mean, come on, the serial driver's twice the size, of, three times the size of that. <laughs> I mean, come on, 7,000 lines of code is not. OK, Greg and Linus, any final thoughts on this? I, I've always, I mean, if you look at our development, I've always said the only thing that's going to stop us is ourselves. I mean, if we mess up somehow. So our goal is not to mess up. <laughs> uh, I would like to, I mean, the point that Ted makes about us being very flexible and having new devices and new usage case, cases come in, uh, it is also the thing that has kept, I think, Linux very interesting as a technical project, and it's also been very interesting how new devices and new usage cases often force us to do something in a different manner. And it almost invariably turns out that some of the old usage case, cases actually really wanted to do that too, but they just never had the impetus to do it. And, and it's been interesting to see how the low power work was started from the embedded world and now all the server people are talking about power awareness right and conversely the server people came in and wanted to do smp and now all the cell phones run two or four cores so it's i think it's been interesting and very healthy for for linux how we've had all these different areas that have have pushed us in different directions yeah, and I think if you amplify the point, one thing that's important about us is that effectively we're just a kernel. We don't constitute a complete system, and that makes us very adaptable to fit into other complete systems, which is the Android thing, I think, that Ted brought up. So, audience, have you've had a bit of time to think about questions, 15 minutes. Has anybody the, actually thought of one? We ahead. have one. Can we have a microphone, Dan? OK, over there first, Dan. Here. Just, just one comment. You know, you, you talk about Linux being so adaptable, but you know, you're talking about cell phones now that are more powerful than what you had 10 years ago. How much adapting did you really need to do? So I think, I mean, well. Phone, Linux were running on cell phones 10 years ago, too. Yeah. yeah so. It runs better on cell phones today than yeah. it did 10 years ago. <laughs> yes. It is definitely, definitely true that one reason why Linux works well on cell phones is that uh, cell phones grew up to the point where they needed a real operating system. Uh, so uh, there's some truth to that. At the same time, it's definitely also true that cell phones did force us to do things in different ways. OK, we need a microphone down here. Oh. 
You have to excuse the, me, the I can't really see. The whole kernel system, the, the communication systems has been built on IRC and email. And whenever you've had a problem, you just went out and invented something. You invented Git. Has social networking had any impact on how you guys interact with each other? Are you going to invent one for us? <laughs> well, so let's start with Sarah, since you've been exposed to social networking for more of your life than the rest of us have. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I think when, uh, you know, when Google Plus came out, there was a lot more technical people on Google Plus. So, so if, for social networking, for me, it's like you know, Facebook's friends. If I'm not your friend on Facebook, it's OK. That's, that's fine. Uh, LinkedIn is for professional stuff. And, and Google Plus seems to be for more technical people now. So I don't know. I, I think that everyone's pretty comfortable with IRC and whatever text editor they have and their, their mutts or, well, or pine or whatever. Actually, let's turn this around. So if, if you asked me that question, I would say that email and IRC are our form of social networking. Would that be a point you'd agree with? In which case, the question to us becomes, is there anything that we could take from the rest of the social networking world and add it to our tools? Assuming we actually know what social networking is. <laughs> Linus. I don't know. I never did the Facebook thing. And the one thing Google Plus taught me is that there's a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I don't know. I, I like the uh, email is still the way I communicate with people when it comes to actual work. Um, and I, I do think that uh, most of the social networking isn't geared towards complicated technical questions that you really need uh, a, a very in-depth medium to answer. And email is both in-depth and, and precise. So then uh, there is some room for a more social uh, environment. IRC has traditionally been the one that the kernel developers use. When was the last time you were actually on the kernel IRC? I don't do IRC. I've seen you on it <laughs> once. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. It's, I think one of the most powerful social networking tools that we've had uh, is the in-person, face-to-face social networking, right? It's literally what we're doing here all, to, all day, right? And I think we've been blessed, uh, the Linux community that is, that uh, you know, it's been so commercially significant that we've been able to afford to be able to bring together, you know, 85 of the top developers so that we can actually renew that social bond so that we, you know, it's, we're much less likely to flame each other if we've actually, you know, you know hoisted a beer over the bar, eaten, eaten together at a table, um, and that actually helps us when we then go back and have to exchange long emails. There's, that's something that we've known for a very, very long time. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we started the Kernel Summit. And it may very well be that there are other open source projects that have not been as lucky to be able to have you know, corporate sponsors and an organization like the Linux Foundation to bring us all together in all of the various different events where you know, things like you know, Google Plus Hangouts might be a substitute. Um, but we've had something which is so much better, which is just the face-to-face -face interaction, that it may have been that that plus IRC and email is just good enough. Maybe so next I'm, year we can try uh, Google Plus Hangout of a mini Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. So I think Uncle one Ted of the advantages of the Kernel Summit is it only happens once a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So, so I think the message, if I could synthesize it from Ted, is if you see a BSD developer, invite them to a party. <laughs> <laughs> There's not many BSD developers anymore. It's sad. Oh, there are still quite a few. <laughs> Any other thoughts on social networking? I swore off IRC for the past six months, and I've never been happier. <laughs> I'll have to try that, actually. <laughs> OK, any other questions from the audience? Yeah, we have one here. Should I stand up? Hi, my name is Alex Polvey. Um, I was curious what stuff going into the kernel right now are you most excited about and why? Well, let's start with Greg, since you see so much of it. Oh, I see crap. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I see, I'm in charge of the staging tree, which is we take the bad vendor but, drivers. But the reason you're in up. charge of the staging tree is because you're excited by crap. Oh, tell not, us yeah. which particular piece of crap excites you now. Well, I'll tell you about this really, no. <laughs> There's this really bad driver we have, but you never believe what it does. Yeah. Every single wireless packet, it thunks it out to user space, then back. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I see the crap, and I see it get cleaned up. I, I just see bad stuff. 
but it's so, supporting new hardware. So it's actually running in some of your phones right now, which is really sad. So you think of yourself basically as the Colonel's toilet brush. I am the Colonel's toilet brush. <laughs> <laughs> see, it's... <laughs> no, I, I don't see new stuff. She's doing new stuff. Okay, so Sarah, tell us about the new stuff. Yeah, there's the interesting stuff, the stuff that's not crap. Well, there, yeah. there's, there's a whole bunch of USB 3 stuff that's going in. If your yeah. USB 3 doesn't work on your Linux laptop, send, send me and the, the Linux USB mailing list email, because it should work. Uh, one of the things that, that I'm excited about outside of my area is um, the Bluetooth 4 stuff that's going in the low, low energy. I was uh, actually contributed to the Kickstarter to get one of the Pebble watches, so I'm, I'm hoping that we have Linux support for Bluetooth 4 low energy for a while. Have, okay, good. Do you have it on Android yet, though, so I can connect my Pebble to my Android phone? So I think one of the important messages there is Sarah would like a Bluetooth watch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I'd like to make a shout out uh, to some work that John Stoltz has been doing, which is volatile memory ranges. And the thing that was really cool about that was that was work that was being done uh, as part of the Lenaro project to take what was admittedly a somewhat dodgy way that Android had to deal with very low memory situations, which is one of these cell phone challenges, uh, and do it in an upstream acceptable way. Uh, so that the kernel could very easily throw away user space where user space is given permission that something you know, could be thrown away because we could very easily regenerate it. Uh, and I, I was talking to uh, someone who worked, uh, works on the Chromium browser and he started salivating saying, oh, this is great. I could use that instantly so that we could make Chrome less uh, uh, memory hungry. Uh, and then earlier this week when we were talking about this uh, Christoph Helwig said, and XFS progs could use this too. Um, and so there's an example of something that started as something that was needed for the cell phones, and XFS progs is, you know, the XFS utilities that have been around for a very, very long time for very high-end uh, performance servers. And that's, that's an example of something that uh, Linus was talking about, about something that was originally for one part of the space and it's going to be useful uh, in many others. And that's just really cool. Okay, and Linus, I think the most interesting thing you do is rename the kernel periodically. Can you tell us what <laughs> names you actually have in mind for the next one? I, really, I, mean, I, don't, I, get, I don't tend to focus so much on something area anymore. And it's probably because most of my work is, is really about... Did I just disappear? Hello? Hello? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what tends to <laughs> make me really excited and happy, uh, this, is, this is really awkward. <laughs> Guys with mics, can we get one? Um, All this strange stuff. There we go. There yeah, go. yeah, there we tends go. To yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah so the, the kinds of things that make me happy are when uh, some really painful process issue gets resolved. So for me, for example, over the last year, it's been ARM has gone from being, for me, a constant headache every single merge window to being a upstanding citizen in the Linux community. And, and those kinds of things make me excited. If you send me a pull request that removes more lines than it adds, that makes me excited. Uh, that sounds a bit sad, but it's true. It's really like I will ignore every single merge window rule and put RC6, if you remove a thousand lines of code, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, like, it's, uh, so audience, there's your challenge. <laughs> do we have any other questions? Okay, then I'll ask one. And it goes to something that Greg got us to. So I think uh, this is another Sean Michael Kerner one. When is 4.0 going to be released? Wait, what's, what's up with me? You were, you were the one agitating for three. Oh, I was agitating for three, yes. Yeah. So, well, so when you get to higher well, numbers, you're When brain. they get old, they forget. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm so happy with three. Um, I don't know, when we get, what, we hit the 30s again? I don't Maybe know. it should be 3.9 and then 4.0. <laughs> nah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It was a, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It's just a number. <laughs> it's just a number. Anybody else have any other comments? I definitely, we are not going to go to like mid 30s. 
uh, it's much easier to tell the difference between five and six than it is between 97 and 98. There's just mentally much easier for people to remember uh, small numbers than big. So we'll do it 4.0 in three years maybe when the sub numbers have grown into the 20s and we say this is this is our feeble brains can't handle this anymore let's start again that's why we go fingers so i think 3 311 would be about the i think most people really like the fact that we just simply went from three digits to two digits yes, uh, yes. So. <laughs> okay any other questions oh you're a hard crowd to please Okay, so this is for the people who've had a longer time to make mistakes. Um, if you could name one thing that you would have done differently, what would it be? And we'll probably start with Ted, since uh, I've been concentrating on this side of the room. Ooh, something that I would do differently. Um, Anything. EXT2, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the TTY layer? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there, I think there are a large number of you know subtle technical things. I don't know that it, uh, I can't think of anything really big uh, or really bad. I think Greg yeah. gave you the clue. I mean, I, I, <laughs> the the thing that I'm very very happy is that I ditched the TTY layer um, before it actually got really complicated, um, because most of the work that I did in the TTY layer assumed a single processor CPU back when we only had a single processor CPU. Uh, and there was a lot of ugliness that was there um, because I was very, very much worried about uh, high-speed serial links on very slow 386 uh, systems. And uh, those days are long gone, right? We, we no longer do massive bulk batch transfers over the serial port, uh, and CPUs have gotten a wee bit faster since then. Um, and so there were, I think, a whole bunch of design trade-offs that I made where that code desperately needed to be rewritten. Uh, and we never got around to rewriting it, um, except for maybe incrementally, slowly, and painfully, uh, for which I can only offer my most abject apologies to the multiple successors who have tried for a couple of years and then ran away screaming. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, but you know, that, it is what it is. <laughs> So, Sarah? I think I'm too young to have regrets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take that. I'll, I'll, I'm sure I'll regret something in the future, but I, I don't have any big regrets right now. It's been fun. Greg? Um, I mentioned it at the kernel summit, config hot plug. I want to get rid of that. That's hey, that been a nightmare. me first. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's been a nightmare. It's caused us too many problems over the years. We so, ended up so saving 100 bytes for it. I mean. Everything's hot pluggable now. I mean, so config hot plug was you, was it? Yes. It oh, was. Right. Oh, okay. maybe him. I don't yeah. remember it. <laughs> and Linus? I'm just offended that you think I've made mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I think on the whole we're doing reasonably well. So. Okay. But, uh, can I get back? I mean, yeah. to Ted's credit, the TTY layer is, is horrible, and I've been recovering from it for years. And that's to Ted's credit. <laughs> but no, no. I mean, it's bad, but at the time, Linux had the best high-speed serial support than anything else. Yeah. And it worked really, really well. And we did much better than everybody else. So unwinding that, you did what we needed to do at the time. Yeah. Yeah. And that was good. It might just, have been crap, we, but it We ignored fast it for crap. too long. I think the problem is that we ignored something for too long, and we're... Recovering. I mean, Alan Cox and Yerzy Slobby is unwinding the mess in a wonderful job, but it's something we ignored for maybe 10 years. Yeah, I mean, there was someone who was going to do a whole lot of really good work to clean it up. I can't even remember his name anymore, and then Transmeta sucked him up, and we never saw him again. Um, but, was you that know, Bill these Holmes. things happen. Bill Holmes? Huh? Yeah, Bill, Bill Holmes. Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So wait, what, what, what do you regret? <laughs> <laughs> I regret a little invitation to a kernel summit in 2002 to talk about re-architecting the SCSI subsystem, I think. <laughs> OK, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we have a question from the audience. Um, I wanted to know if there are any tools that you think are really great right now. Any tools you think are really great? Linus, you can't talk about Git, so give us another one. <laughs> Linus is tongue-tied. We go on perf. to Greg. Uh, I mean, perf. I've, 
I think I ignored it for too long. Perf is amazing. Um, it lets you do, I mean, the stuff you were doing with Perf to do the low level debugging. And we have GUI tools with it now. And we're, we are, Linus was arguing about where to draw the arrow and things like that. Um, so Perf is amazing. Perf, I strongly recommend everybody using it. Um, it's and it's easy to use. Yeah. I re it really is. You don't need to configure anything. You don't need to be root. You don't need to do anything at all. You just do perf record on your problem spot. And if it's CPU limited, you'll know exactly where. Sarah? I like perf. It's perf good. Although I wish that they would actually change the name to something you could Google for. <laughs> <laughs> Ted? Yeah. Uh, so the tool that I've been using that's actually helped me the most uh, is KVM. Uh, the fact that I can build a kernel on my laptop, kick off a regression test, uh, and then let it run while I'm doing other things is just so much easier than what I did before. I mean, at one point I actually had a little X10 controller so I could power cycle this machine, and then it would TFTP boot because that was how I was doing my testing was, you know, kind of awful and it only worked from home. Uh, and so as a developer, you know, most people think of KVM as this wonderful tool that they use, you know, it, at, uh, you know, Rackspace or other, you know, sort of cloud providers. Um, but as a developer tool, it's just, you know, it's been one of the things that's made my life so much easier. Right. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Yep, okay, we have one here. Hello. Uh, well, you can do okay. pistols at dawn. Oh, oh, you go right. first. Um, there's a lot that's been, uh, you know, there's a lot that's said about uh, the quantity and, and quality of drivers for things in, in Linux. And so I wonder, philosophically, whose responsibility is, is driver quality for things? The, the developers, the maintainers. the maintainers, the users for not complaining enough, the hardware vendors for not you know, shutting up and putting out open source code for their hardware when they release it? Uh, I mean, you have to realize we have a million drivers and they're all different and some are really good because they are very common. We've had drivers for a long time that we've been able to just generate good libraries for and everybody uses them and they get debugged immediately if something breaks. And then there's the driver that one person uses in his basement to measure his temperature. And surprise, surprise, if anybody else were to try to use it, it would break immediately because it just wasn't tested by anybody else. So the notion that there's drivers in general is just false. There's, there's a whole range of uh, quality issues, there's a whole range of who did it sometimes that manufacturers do the drivers. Uh, that's not always good. Sometimes the manufacturers do absolutely horrible drivers. Yeah. And uh, Sometimes, to be fair, the hardware is also so bad that it's very hard to construct That is absolutely true, driver. too, yeah. that sometimes drivers, most of the work in the driver is working around the fact that the hardware is just crap. Yep. So it's not our so, fault, usually. So it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it, that's a big question, but, but in the end, it's mostly Greg who ends up being the head point man for most of the drivers. In, so if I think point. I'd have to say the worst examples of hardware are almost always in USB, so you two no, get to comment. No, on no, 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 wireless. Wire. Scuzzy. <laughs> Scuzzy. No, USB, to, uh, there's only so much you can do with USB. I mean, <laughs> and, and sometimes the, the, the USB devices are just fundamentally broken. And yes. you just end up That's what I was saying. Them, you know? Yeah, but, but, but I mean, it's not the driver's fault. You know? it's no, fault. but I was saying there's a lot of broken hardware that we just can't work around. I mean, in Scuzzy, yeah. it's the USB drivers that refuse to tell us if they have a cache behind the USB thing. And yes. We don't know when to flush yes. them. And yeah. we've got these data loss problems when the system's suspended. What do you expect when the chip costs you five cents? I mean, it's, yeah. there's a reason it's cheap. Yeah, it should be running Linux, right? Yeah. So I, I think I turned the question around, right? Good, good drivers is everybody's responsibility. And it's a team effort. And there are a lot of people who have done a lot of good work to make sure that we've had all of the great drivers that uh, the questioner was, was talking about, um, from the laptop and server manufacturers who made it a demand of their component suppliers that there be an open source driver, um, to uh, companies like Intel who have done really, really good Linux drivers natively, 
to manufacturers that have done you know, so-so or really crappy drivers, uh, and then they go through the staging process, and Greg and his volunteers who then improve it, um, it's many, many people who've, who have you know, worked together to get us to the point that we are. And, and I think it's, it's important to acknowledge everyone who has worked towards uh, that and encourage them all to continue doing all that really, really good work. Well, it's, it's also the testers, too. Everyone yes, who's running Linux on their laptop and actually yeah. sends us a bug report when something breaks. You know, you guys are important, too. That's, yeah, yeah most important, because it works for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so everybody who runs Linux on their laptop should be running the latest of a community distribution, so you're increasing our testing pool. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, one thing worth noting about drivers is I think that's the source of most of our kernel developers. I, even if you don't end up doing driver development, almost everybody starts doing driver development because that's how you get sucked in uh, trying to fix your one particular device that you happen to have. And then you start with the driver and soon you're fixing the VM system. <laughs> okay, so we had another question over there, I think. Uh, yes. So for years there was this crusade to get rid of the big kernel lock. What is the current quest these days? It's gone. Where's Arnd? Where's Arnd? Give him a round of applause because it's gone. Yeah, he did an awesome job. What's the next thing? What's next? What's the next big challenge in the kernel? Well, there's the TTY lock, which we kind of just move the big kernel lock into the TTY layer. <laughs> nobody. Nobody, nobody does high, school, high speed serial across multiple devices, except it turns out your cell phone wants to talk high speed serial to the other processor. Anyway, we're working on that, but uh, TTY block, I don't know, it's big. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the big kernel lock was interesting because it involved a lot of different people. Uh, it's, there aren't that many things that cross you know, that many boundaries anymore. Uh, there might be a few things where we need to have people from the VM layer and the VFS layer uh, cooperating, um, but uh, you know, there aren't that many things that, that are like the BKL removal project. Maybe power, because power yeah, touches power. a lot of different systems. I mean, yes. Power yeah. management took us a long time in general, because yeah. every single time, I mean, we, yeah. we still have just dropping the actual power usage, but all our hot plug issues and all the yeah. power management mm -hmm. in, that we mostly do correctly now for things like suspend and resume, that took forever, exactly because it crossed a lot of boundaries. And, uh, up and down, as and well as... And, yeah, so we're still improving it. I mean, it was only two kernel revisions ago that my X220i actually went from about four hours battery life to eight hours battery life. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep, we have another one. What about licensing? Do you see GPL version 2 only as a limiting factor? Or are you, is there any... <laughs> chance for a broader license since projects are moving on to GPL version 3? Well, that's Alina's question, isn't it? Um, GPL version 2 is it, and that is the broader license. It's not as restrictive as the alternative. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Well I think we're all we're fairly unanimous on this one, right? That was very well said. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'll ask one. Well, we do to have some more. There is one? Mm -hmm. Two. Okay. Yeah, hi. Um, so there's been um, continuous talk about including more some user space stuff into kind of like the kernel stuff that would kind of constitute a basic um, Linux system. I was just wondering if I could have your thoughts about how far that would go, what would get included in there, and where would you draw the line, if that makes any sense. Okay, Greg nodded. You can answer it. <coughs> Case by case basis. No, I'm serious. I mean, perf, perf worked out really good to be in there. And I don't know. People have argued for all of KVM to be in there, and that might be too much. You know, I don't. It's it's a fine line. Anybody else? There are serious disadvantages to putting stuff in the kernel tree. Uh, so, on the whole, you don't want to do it. Then occasionally you have something that ends up being so closely tied to the kernel and has developer overlap too, where putting it in the kernel tree makes it easier both for the developers and the users. And I think perf was a perfect example of that. Uh, but it has, it's actually fairly rare. So right now we have perf, we have some testing scripts that hopefully somebody uses. And uh, 
that's pretty much it. I don't think we have that much else user space wise, except for our own kernel configuration tools and stuff like that, that we just need for the kernel itself. I, th I think one of, the, one of the, it touches back to something we said earlier about the kernel flexibility and being able to work on lighter weight devices. Um, the fact that we don't include, for example, a C library can be a big advantage because glibc is perfect in certain environments, but it's also kind of big and kind of bloated. And if you're going to be doing really, really small devices, people have generally used other C libraries. Uh, and there's good reasons for that. And, and so the fact that those things are packaged separately has actually been, uh, you know, has had some real advantages. Disadvantages too, but a lot of good advantages. Okay, so I think we're, all, we're out of time. We have time for probably one more question, and then I'll ask the panel for closing statements. Uh, what criteria are there, if any, when you decide to remove a driver? For example, I have one practical case where the company who contributed the driver is out of business. It is next to impossible to find. After a lot of effort, I managed to find one in Serbia, of all places, and I, got, I managed to destroy it as well. <laughs> So I can't fix the driver. Um, personally, I would like to get rid of the whole thing. But what sort of criteria are there when, when you decide to just, OK, I give up. I, nobody can test it. Nobody seems to have hardware. And let's get rid of it. So this came up in the Kernel Summit. Oh, you want to summarize. OK. I was well, I, I'm not going to summarize the thing. But I'm also, I am going to say that one of the criteria has to be that it has to be a pain point. Uh, if it's something that we can just carry around and nobody ever complains about and it still compiles and uh, fixing it up for small changes so that it continues to compile, there's no reason to remove it. I mean, don't remove it just because you get rid of a thousand lines hey, and make me happy. I don't care about those things. If you removed all my MCA drivers, I used to be MCA maintainer, you know. <laughs> that may have been the pain point. <laughs> No, I mean, we do remove drivers Token ring. We just so, have token ring. Uh, yeah, we actually removed some fairly recently. But on the other hand, we mentioned the 3C501 driver, which is like the original driver. I mean, pretty much. It's been there since not day one, but since we had networking. And I don't think anybody has that card. But the only reason to remove it would be to remove it. There's no other real reason to do so. So then. You're actually, from a Git perspective, you're using more energy to remove it than just leaving it alone. It's like, don't do it. Yeah, I mean, I always say, if there, as long as there's somebody who uses it, or is there a piece of hardware out there, it's OK to keep. If there's no hardware anywhere. Like, you just have a, one machine in your basement. It's the whole architecture in the world. I still have a machine in my basement yeah, when you remove one. Voyager. <laughs> Then maybe you might question the person's sanity. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. There's a one, so we keep it. There's one user, we keep it, right? So, no. No, it we dropped removed. it. The Voyager was dropped, oh, God, years ago. Yeah. Oh, I oh. thought. <laughs> I thought we <laughs> so, so the rule of thumb is if it's my driver, you can remove it. Otherwise, <laughs> we keep it. That one was actually causing pain. Yes, right? that, that was. That was. That was. Reason Voyager why. was a pain. Right. <laughs> OK, so I think we have to wrap this up here. So we'll wrap up with each of you having 30 seconds to give an inspiring statement to the audience about why they should become kernel developers. And we'll start with someone who's had the least time to think, which is Ted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you should become a kernel developer if it's fun. I've been doing it for a long time, and it's been a blast for me. Uh, on the other hand, if there's something else that you know, really floats your boat and makes you excited, do that. That's, that's the most important thing. OK. Sarah? Uh, I became a kernel developer because I liked being where the software met the hardware, where I could actually fiddle with things and blink lights and, and write drivers. And you know, if, if that's something you like, device drivers are for you. If you like messing with memory, then memory is for you. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's a fun community. You know, our, our, we've got some rough edges. But once you get to know people, it's, it's been fun. Thank I'll, you. Greg? I'll agree with them. But also, I mean, we, if you want to be a kernel developer, um, thought there's lots of choices to travel. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we figured it out. Ted figured out what? We can travel every other week. There's a Linux conference somewhere in the world you can do. <laughs> and I think he was at all of them. Um, <laughs> uh, so I mean, if you want to see the world, become a kernel developer. 
<laughs> Great. And Linus. Uh, so I'm with Sarah. I started doing kernels because I think user mode programming is boring and I'm really interested in the hardware, but I wouldn't want to actually build it myself. Uh, but at the same time, as mentioned earlier, we have enough kernel developers to some degree. There are tons of really worthy open source projects that need help. And uh, so we, I would not want to argue that people should be kernel developers because quite often they should be developers in some other project entirely. So Linus's final thoughts are go hack on something else. And with that, <laughs> we'll say thank you very much to our panel and thank you very much to you for having us. All right. I want you, uh, I want you guys to stay up here for just one second. I rarely give advice to this crew, but I'm just going to give a, a small word of advice. When you start talking about how old you are and you're trying to portray yourself as young, here's a couple of do nots. Talking about the time before cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> Finally signing up today for the Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Discussing your regrets. You notice Sarah had no regrets. <laughs> And then finally, and I think this is the, the, the one, is talking about the social networking crazies. 